going to be a demonstration of the aorta and the inferior vena cava with all the branches and tributaries. This is the supine cadaver. I'm standing on the right side. Camera person, Ken Dolcomber Batch is on the left side. So this structure that we see in front of us, this is the abdominal aorta. The extent of the abdominal aorta is from T12 at the aortic hiatus to its bifurcation over L4 into common iliacs. Just to the right of the abdominal aorta, we have this, this is the inferior vena cava. The full extent of the inferior vena cava in the abdomen is from T8, this opening, to L5 at its bifurcation into the two common iliac veins. The length of the inferior vena cava is technically more than the length of the aorta in the abdomen. However, we cannot see the full length of the inferior vena cava. And you can see the cut portion of the inferior vena cava here. And you can see the other cut portion here. This segment was inside the liver. So therefore, once the IVC enters the liver, and then we cannot see it anymore. And thereafter, it immediately penetrates through the diaphragm, cable hiatus, and it goes straight into the right atrium. Now let's take a look at the branches of the aorta. And wherever relevant, we will mention the tributaries of the inferior vena cava. Best way to remember the branches of the aorta in the abdomen are the rule of three. Three paired parietal branches, three paired visceral branches, and three unpaired visceral branches. This is the celiac trunk, which I have lifted up here. Unpaired visceral branch number one. Superior mesenteric trunk, unpaired visceral branch number two. Inferior mesenteric, unpaired visceral number three. Now let's come to the paired visceral. The first paired visceral, this one, the largest. The left renal artery and the right renal artery. The next paired visceral, this small one, the right suprarenal artery and the next paired visceral is this one. The right gonadal artery and the left gonadal artery. Now let's come to the paired parietal branches. The topmost paired parietal branch is the subcostal artery which we cannot see here because it is under the 12th rib. The next one is the inferior phrenic artery. We can see only the right inferior phrenic artery and I have retracted here to show. This is the one of the other paired parietal branches. And we can see the other portion of the inferior phrenic here. On the left side, we cannot see it very clearly. And the third set of paired parietal branches are these. I have retracted the aorta to show these branches. These are the lumbar arteries. We can see one here. We can see another one here. We can see another one here. And we can see that they're accompanied by the lumbar veins. So these are the paired branches. And we can see them on the other side also. So these are the branches. Now let's mention a quick word about each of them. So this is the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk arises from T12, very close to the aortic hiatus. This is the aortic hiatus. My, my instrument is tracing the aortic hiatus. The celiac trunk is a very short trunk and the moment it arises, it gives three major branches. The largest is this one, the splenic artery. And we can recognize the splenic artery by its extreme tortuosity because it is forming part of the bed of the stomach and it runs along the superior part of the pancreas, which has been removed. The second largest branch, we have cut it. This is the common hepatic artery. This common hepatic artery runs to the right, and then it makes a curve up and becomes a hepatic artery proper after it gives off the gastroduodenal artery. And this hepatic artery proper enters into the liver, which also has been removed. The smallest branch of the celiac trunk is this one here. This is the left gastric artery. And we can see that it is also giving a branch to the esophagus here. This is the esophageal branch. The vein accompanying the esophageal branch that forms part of the site of portal systemic anastomosis, which gets enlarged in cirrhosis with portal hypertension. So that's about the celiac trunk. Now let's take a look at the superior mesenteric trunk. This is the superior mesenteric trunk, which arises from L1 level. And we can see these numerous branches here. So let's take them sequentially. The first branch is the inferior pancreatic or duodenal. We have removed the pancreas and the duodenum. And this goes from below, divides into anterior and posterior divisions, and it anastomoses with the superior pancreatic or duodenal and supplies the head of the pancreas and the C-loop of the duodenum. This cut section that we see here is the next branch. This is the middle colic artery. Then we can see these other numerous branches. These are respectively the jejunal and the ileal branches. This is the terminal branch, the ileocolic artery, which supplies the ileocecal junction. We see yet one branch which I have not named yet, this one here. This was an aberration in this particular cadaver. This came out from the superior mesenteric artery. It went behind like this 
and it went and supplied the right anatomical lobe of the liver. So this is an aberrant supply to the right lobe of the liver from the superior mesenteric artery. So these are the distributions of the superior mesenteric artery. Now let's take a look at this one here. This is the inferior mesenteric artery, which arises from the level of L3. And we can see these branches here. We have retained a few of them. This one is a supply of the hindgut. So therefore, it gives the left colic artery, which divides into ascending, descending, and supplies the descending colon. And we can see some other branches also. And these are the other branches. These were the ones which were supplying the sigmoid colon, namely sigmoid 1, sigmoid 2, sigmoid 3. And thereafter, the rest of the inferior mesentery continues down, as we can see, into the pelvis as the superior rectal artery. So these are the distributions of the three unpaired visceral branches. Now let's come to the paired visceral branches, the largest one, namely the renal arteries. This is the right renal artery and this is the left renal artery. Renal arteries arise approximately at the level of L1. In this particular cadaver, we see two renal arteries. So I have lifted up the kidney, right kidney, and we can see that before it enters, it has become one anterior and one posterior. These renal arteries, in this particular case two, they enter the hilum of the kidney and thereafter they divide into five segmental arteries. And that is what allows us to do what is known as segmental nephrectomy. In this particular cadaver, we can also see the renal artery is giving a branch to the right suprarenal gland. And this is the suprarenal gland, which is located right behind the inferior vena cava, very close to it. This is the left renal artery. And here also we can see that before it enters, it divides into two branches. This is one branch and this is the other branch. And here also the anterior one divides into an anterior superior, anterior inferior, and the posterior one divides into three other branches at the renal hilum. And these are the five segmental arteries which supply the kidney. This is the, the renal artery. In this case, we cannot see a clear branch going to the left suprarenal gland. This is the left suprarenal gland. This is the right gonadal vessel. And we can see the vein is coming from the pelvis. In this case, it's a female cadaver. And the vein drains into the inferior vena cava on the right side. The corresponding artery is here. This is the gonadal artery. On the left side, this is the left ovarian gonadal artery. And this vein that we can see here, this is the left gonadal or the ovarian vein. In the case of the left side, it does not drain into the inferior vena cava. Instead, it drains directly into the left renal vein. So that is about the paired visceral branches. I have retracted the aorta to the left and the inferior vena cava to the right to show the lumbar vessels. I would draw your attention to these veins here. These are the lumbar veins which accompany the lumbar arteries. These lumbar veins, as they go to the inferior vena cava, they communicate with each other and a vein runs up and that is known as the ascending lumbar vein which is more prominent on the right side. However, a small one will also be present on the left side. In this particular case, we can see it's giving a tributary to the left kidney. These ascending lumbar veins will then continue up, especially on the right side. It will unite with the subcostal vein and then it will form the azygous vein. And the azygous vein then runs with the aorta through the aortic hiatus. I have retracted the aorta at the aortic hiatus and this is the beginning of the azygous vein at the aortic hiatus. So the ascending lumbar veins, especially on the right side, unites with the subcostal vein and forms the azygous vein which travels to the right of the aorta through the aortic hiatus and it enters into the thorax and where it becomes bigger and it continues and opens into the superior vena cava. The next structure which I want to bring to your attention which I have not mentioned till now is this branch here which is arising from the posterior aspect of the aorta. This is an unpaired branch, a parietal branch called the median sacral artery. The median sacral artery arises from the bifurcation of the aorta where it bifurcates into the two common iliacs and we can see that one here. And this descends down like a tail exactly in the midline and it continues down and it supplies the pelvic structures where it anastomoses with the sacral arteries. So this median sacral artery is also an unpaired parietal branch which does not conform to the rule which I mentioned in the beginning. Now let me mention a few other points which I have not mentioned till now. What we are seeing here is a very cleaned out dissection, but in actual life this is not the case. 
This entire segment of the aorta was completely thickly enmeshed with the plexus, nerve plexus, which is a composite of sympathetic and parasympathetic. There was a celiac plexus here, there was a superior mesenteric plexus here, there was an intermesenteric plexus here, and there was an inferior mesenteric plexus here, and there was an aortico renal plexus here. All those have been removed. The other thing which has been removed were numerous lymph nodes. These were the aortocable or the lumbar lymph nodes, which ultimately drain everything from the pelvis and from the lower limb, and they go into the cisterna chile. So these two structures have been removed. Now let me mention a few important clinical correlations pertaining to the abdominal aorta. Aneurysm of the abdominal aorta is well documented, especially atherosclerotic aneurysm. It usually arises between the origin of the renal arteries and stops the bifurcation of the aorta into the common iliac. So this is the region where the abdominal aortic aneurysm takes place. And arising from the apex of the aneurysm will be the inferior mesenteric artery. If we can see and feel an expanded cell pulsation on the abdomen, then it is very significant of an ab abdominal aortic aneurysm. And if it is more than six centimeters, then there's a very high likelihood of rupture. In a thin wall or a thin individual with a very thin abdominal wall, we can sometimes normally feel the pulsation of the abdominal aorta just before its bifurcation at the level of L4 against the lumbar vertebra where it makes a curve forwards. That is normal. The abdominal aorta is a very common route and a very useful route for angiogram. The usual procedure is to cannulate the femoral artery. And here you can see that they had cannulated the femoral artery for the purpose of embalming. Femoral artery pulsation is felt in the femoral triangle and it is cannulated from here and the catheter is then passed up through the external iliac, through the common iliac into the abdominal aorta. And depending on which vessel we want to visualize, we can cannulate either the inferior mesenteric artery, the renal artery, the superior mesenteric artery or the celiac artery and we can do the corresponding angiogram. Another important clinical correlation that we can see in this cadaver, if you were to feel it here, you will get a crunchy feeling and perhaps it can be heard also. This is a sign of advanced age and this is a particularly aged cadaver. This is calcific medial sclerosis, calcification of the tunica media and that is also referred to as Monkeberg's medial calcific sclerosis. The inferior vena cava also can be cannulated through the femoral vein and it can be used for cardiac catheterization procedures. So these were some of the points which I want to mention about the aorto cable structures which are visible and the distribution and the branches and the tributaries in the abdomen. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Dr. Sanjay Sanyal signing out. Have a nice day.